It's been such a long process and journey, and it unfolds for everyone in such a unique way. I was in complete shock, and I left for college four weeks later after my diagnosis. Introducing Daria Shavatsky. After college, I went to graduate school, then I went to law school, and then I, I got a master's in social work. Daria received her bachelor's from Harvard, her MS from Columbia, and her law degree at Fordham School of Law. And he said, I only have one issue with your vision, with your condition. It's that you can't fully accept that it's not an issue for me and that it never will be. So that moment changed everything. Facilitating telesupport groups for blind and visually impaired teenage high school students. I really wish I hadn't wasted so much time isolating myself, but the technology changed my life almost overnight. I will put a plug in for these groups. They are totally free for the participants. You call in using a toll-free number and people call in from all over the country and we, and we meet by phone. This interview is done by Blind Abilities teen correspondent, Simon Bonifant. The more open you are in your life to meeting people and to just to new experiences, the more comes your way. So please welcome Daria Shavatsky and Simon Bonifant. We hope you enjoy. Really, just be gentle on yourself, because I think the journey is just, you know, it's a lifelong journey, and you have to take it one day at a time. Hi, everyone. My name is Simon Bonifant. I'm reporting for Blind Abilities, and I'm here with Daria Zavachki. How are you doing, Daria? Good. How are you doing, Simon? Good. I'm doing very well. And we are in New York City right now, in uh, Manhattan area. And Daria, what do you do? You work with the Lighthouse Guild for the Blind? Yes, I work with the Lighthouse Guild, and I'm a clinical social worker, and I facilitate telesupport groups for blind and visually impaired high school students. And you are blind as well, correct? Exactly, yes. I have retinitis pigmentosa. Okay. Have your blindness from when you were born, or did it come on later in your life? Well, I was born with a recessive genetic disease that we did not know about till I was diagnosed at age 17. So it started with issues at night and in the dark and bumping into things, but they really weren't able to diagnose it till I was 17. And when you were 17, what was it like for you? Had you had any experience with other people that were blind? Because your brother is blind as well, right? My brother's blind as well. When I was diagnosed, my three siblings were also brought to the same specialist, and we learned that two of the three of them were also diagnosed with retinitis oh, pigmentosa. So you all found out together? All three of us, yes. Sure. And my parents were in shock because there is no family history. My, my parents each carry the recessive of gene unbeknownst to them. And my brother's younger, so he still had a lot of working eyesight. He was 13 when I was diagnosed at 17. So. And his name is Isaac Litsky? Yes. And very good story as well. Oh, but, he yeah. would be amazing for your podcast, Simon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he would do it gladly. So when you were 17 and found out that you had this blindness diagnosis, what was your reactions and did you have like a plan to move forward or what was your kind of feeling about it? I think it's been such a long process and journey and it unfolds for everyone in such a unique way. I was in complete shock and I left for college four weeks later after my diagnosis. I was diagnosed um, end of July and I was leaving for college. So I think the first year I was kind of more in denial and I just tried not to think about it. At that point, did you have the same vision you have now or different? I had a lot more eyesight back then. Now I have very limited central vision, so I use all assistive technology to work on my computer and audiobooks, and I use a cane for mobility. But in college, I could pretty much get by. People just thought I was ditzy more than visually impaired, and I was very private about it. Looking back, I wish I had not been so private. I wish I had been open. It made my life harder, being so private about it. So what happened after you got out of college? Were you able to go to college successfully, and then what kind of things happened? Was your eyesight still still very well at that time? My eyesight really, I felt, was functional. After college, I went to graduate school, and then I went to law school, and then I, I got a master's in social work. And in those years, I was starting to have more difficulty, but also not willing to embrace technology. So I just, everything took me twice as long, which does not sound like a great plan. <laughs> but then really for me, when I had my kids, my eyesight took a very big hit. And, and apparently pregnancy can do that with this type of disease because of the hormones and, uh, and that kind of a thing. After my son was born, I remember I went to a bank machine 
machine and I couldn't, the screen was just blurry. And that's when I realized I, I could no longer read using my eyes. So that was very- And at that time, what did your husband say about that? My eyesight? husband's amazing. Oh. So we've been together 25 years. We met at age 20. He's really the only person I told and it's never been a big thing for him. I think he's really an enlightened person. So he knows like when you love someone, first of all, there are no guarantees for anyone. And also for him, it's just part of, of who I am. In our early marriage, I was just convinced that eventually it was gonna be an issue for him. And then, you know, he would find someone who wasn't, you know, in my mind had this issue. And he sat me down one day when I had trouble signing our daughter into kindergarten and I was really upset about it. And our daughter was upset about it. And he said, I only have one issue with your vision, with your condition. It's that you can't fully accept that it's not an issue for me and that uh -huh. it never will be. So that moment changed everything. Well, that was an interesting way of him <laughs> saying it, that he actually had an issue with the way you were viewing about him. So he was acceptable of it. Wow, yeah, exactly. I was projecting onto him that it must concern him, it must upset him. And he just said, no, I just want you to be safe and happy and thriving. And it's not a problem. Wow. So that probably was helpful for you. As very well. helpful. It really was a very pivotal moment for me because I finally was able to, I think, also accept it for myself. How did you get the skills and the technology that you have today? How did that come about when you felt like you needed it? Well, after our second, we have two kids 18 months apart. They're now teenagers. For about a year, I didn't email anybody. I didn't look at People Magazine, which I loved. And finally, a friend of mine said to call this guy from a, a tech company, assistive technology company. He came to my house and taught me a bunch of things. I got my CCTV and my iPhone, and it's just things started changing. I really wish I hadn't wasted so much time isolating myself, but the technology changed my life almost overnight. So that was amazing. And how long ago was that? That was almost 14 years ago now. Oh, and that's been good for you ever since. That's great. It's amazing. And, and that's why I'm so in awe of, of you and the other, you know, teens in our groups who are way ahead of the curve, super enlightened and really discovering things at a much younger age in your lives where you can manage your life and nothing limits you. And just a backstory for the podcast, uh, we know each other because Daria runs a phone group for blind teens in the United States from the Lighthouse Guild for the Blind in New York. And you've also ran a few other groups that you've done as well. Uh, could you talk to the listeners about how you got involved? with that and what your experience has been like with that? Sure. So I have a clinical social work license and about 12 years ago, someone reached out from the lighthouse. Was I interested in running a group for parents who have children with retinitis pigmentosa? So for the first few years, I ran telesupport groups for parents. And then I started to run groups for college students and high school students. Before my kids were born, I was an elementary school counselor for many years. And I really love working with kids so and teens, especially at this point. I will put a plug in for these groups. They are totally free for the participants. You call in using a toll-free number and people call in from all over the country and we, and we meet by phone. And what are all the groups that you've done throughout the years that you've been doing this? So for the past 10 years, I focused more on the college groups and high school students. And we just talk about leaving for college, career, dating, assistive technology, any kind of topics that the students want to talk about. Good. And you have a wealth of resources, a wealth of knowledge of people around the city and in New York. How did you get some of these contacts that you know? Is it personal experience or did you get them from the guild? Or Well, it's interesting. And I think you've mentioned this before, Simon, like the more open you are in your life to meeting people and to just to new experiences, the more comes your way. And I had originally reached out to the Commission for the Blind for my own training, cane training and daily living skills training. And that's how I met the woman, my counselor at the Commission, who wound up recommending me for the job. So that was pretty amazing. Since then, it's just, you know, a network in the city of visually impaired and blind people that I know. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people in New York that are visually impaired and blind. So it's a good city to be in. You know, I agree. I think it's a great way. city. What would you say are some of the most helpful tools that you use, like transportation? What would you say the most helpful tools to you for your success? I'm a cane user. I think about a dog one day down the line. Uh, that definitely interests me. But taxis and Uber and subway. Yeah, and... it's very accessible for that in New York too exactly. as well. What would you say would be advice for either students who are blind and transitioning or older adults who are blind? What would be some advice that you would give to them? I would say don't be hard on yourself. 
you know, you're going to have good days and bad days. You're going to make mistakes like anybody else. And I think we hold ourselves to a really high standard when we're trying to be independent, for example. But everybody needs help. Sighted people need help and blind people need help. And so the advice I like to pass along to teens is really just be gentle on yourself because I think the journey is just, you know, it's a lifelong journey and you have to take it one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And how was it raising your children being blind or what is that like for you? Well, I think it's been great because I think it does make them more sensitive, more aware of other people. I used to worry when they were younger that there were limitations I had as a mom, but I think kids are very resilient and when it's all they know, they do great. And I'll tell you one funny story. When I first started using my cane, my kids were about five and six and I had learned how to use it and I pulled it out to walk them to school and I had prepared a very emotional touching speech to tell them all about how people might stare, but this made me independent and I was going on and on with my speech and I was in tears and I finished my long speech to them and then my son said, mom, after school today, can we see the new SpongeBob movie? (laughs) So I realized this was not a big thing for them. It was just a cane that I was using and and that was an amazing experience too as a blind mom to, to learn that uh that's great. You know, we project a lot of stuff onto other people. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting when we're talking about uh, your husband and things like that. I think part of our fears that we experience is actually stuff that we think about in our head that that we could be projecting onto people that when we get in the situation, it actually ends up being better than we would think. It's kind of uh, kind of interesting how that works. I could not agree more. Yeah, exactly. It's the thoughts in your mind, like your inner critic. And uh, yes, that's something to be aware of. And who has been your biggest role model? Someone that you could you know, talk to and trust and really share the same views as you. Who has been your biggest role model through your challenges and triumphs and all the things that you've been doing? Well, I would say my greatest support has been my husband. He's really amazing. In terms of my journey as a blind person, my younger brother, Isaac, I would say no question has been such a role model for me. He kind of arrived at, I would, I would say, um, you know, places along his journey earlier than I did and younger and he was always helpful to me to take that next step so he's it's been great to have someone I can talk very to very good yeah, yeah he's he's a very inspiring that's an inspiring person and so are you well <laughs> thank you Simon <laughs> so is there is there any other thing that you'd like to say to the listeners I was thinking about two themes in my life that have been very intertwined and and those are gratitude and friendship and I feel like anyone lucky enough to have that you know as a part of your life really you can overcome anything so gratitude for me and I talk about this with my brother a lot when losing our eyesight has really been a lucky experience in a lot of ways for me personally I've learned in the deepest sense the power of friendship and kindness uh, in a very meaningful way and I've also learned how lucky I am what really matters, not to focus on the small stuff. My friends joke around, when you're a mom to teenagers, it's good what you don't see. So I kind of view that as a perk now. (laughs) Some of the stuff I'm actually missing. So that's really my views about that. And then friendship. And for me, that word's pretty broad. It's just really just having anyone that cares about you in your life, whether it's, you know, your parents or colleagues or, or doctor. And that's another area where going through something medical and and being diagnosed at a young age, I think if you're lucky enough to have a community respond and parents respond in a certain way, it just fills your life with so much hope and love and all the good stuff. At the end of the day, if you take the the bigger picture of your life and zoom out, um, it's really amazing how lucky I feel. So my parents, Carlos and Betty Lipsky, they had three of their four children diagnosed in 1992 out of nowhere, no family history, um, no knowledge about this. Unbeknownst to them, they each carried this recessive gene mutation. And when we were teenagers, they were basically told there's no hope. They're, you know, they're going blind. There's nothing you can do. There never will be. So they reacted in such a resilient and graceful way and basically just said, we have to be a part of a solution or at least try to be a part of a solution and raise awareness and raise desperately needed funds for scientific and medical research and in their mission to do that. And I understand that so much more now as a mom. I can't even imagine what that was like for them, but they really rallied. Uh, It started with our whole community, our our beloved Cuban Jewish community in Miami Beach, Florida. So they just joined us and, and our friends and family tirelessly volunteering their time, putting on events, spearheaded originally by Jaime and Jenny Edelstein. Jaime was actually my childhood pediatrician 
who is such a loving friend. Uh, Joe and I later on down the line asked him to perform our wedding ceremony, which he did. So he wants me to mention he does not do weddings for the record. He's just a famous pediatrician. <laughs> but so, you know, people like him and, and our friends down there, they formed this chapter. We, we started this organization, Hope for Vision. And in Miami was the first chapter called Heart Sight Miami. And they started raising, you know, much needed funding, which leads me to another kind of friendship, which for us, we've been so lucky to meet so many wonderful scientists and doctors and specialists all over the world. As we learned more about the research and wanted to be a part of supporting it, we've had the friendship of incredible, inspiring, brilliant minds, including my specialist, Dr. Sam Jacobson at the Shea I Institute, who uh, we've known since 1992, who not only fights for every research dollar and has spent his entire life you know, because he believes that there are answers out there, but for the funding, the issue for scientists for so many diseases, but he, I mean, I've literally cried on this doctor's shoulder for decades. So he, he will stay at his office with any patient well into, until 9, 10 at night, well after he should be going home and answer questions about research and listen to someone crying, drive them to the Philly train station, you know, insisting you can't take a taxi. So I think it's just been an amazing journey in that way. We had one friend and very well-known philanthropist, Adrian Arsht, who donated $1 million to Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, designated for retinal degenerative diseases. So yes, I didn't want to leave that out. And and on top of that, you know, the friendships with my friends, like that, you know, my, my lifelong, I call them my sister friends from high school, from college, who help me and, and they're with me in a way that I forget. I, I forget when I'm with them that I can't see the world, they see the world the way they see it because they forget too. So it's it's just, it's really, I think, such a powerful force my teenagers who are my friends who handle this with resilience and make me feel like any other mom and of course I know I mentioned Joe who's been my best friend for a quarter of a century. We talk about how he's my favorite sighted guide but also for me like I feel like in a metaphorical and spiritual sense he's my sighted guide in the universe beyond just in, in a literal sense. I want to relay the message to other, especially young, young teenagers or adolescents or young people going through this, that if you open your heart and you feel that and you, and you allow yourself to feel deserving, that you can really harness that to accomplish whatever you want and go about, about your life. Well, that's great, Daria. I've always said that if you have family and friends in your life and you're going through a hard time, you can get through anything. Now, going back to your parents, when you were first diagnosed with the blindness, how did they get the idea started that they wanted to do this foundation and how did they get that goal started? So, you know, they reached out originally. They, they, they were in contact with the Foundation Finding Blindness um, before we, my brother and then my family were, were running Hope for Vision, but they really leaned on a lot of friends. I think my mom, um, you know, her, her unconditional love, she just couldn't, she couldn't really accept the diagnosis in a way. And she really went about trying to contribute to the science. So in later years as adults, we realized, and we've helped her come to realize, by the way, mom, this blindness gig isn't so bad. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's okay that you have to be patient and, and maybe the answer will be there and maybe it won't. That's the beauty of the story is that there was no, you know, uh, my brother always says like when we, when we were younger, it was like the scientists were the heroes and the blindness was the villain and we were like in a race against time who was going to win but the reality is there is no villain there are no heroes these are all just concepts we have going on in our inner minds and, and you have to just really take it one year at a time one day at a time accept what's going on and then make the best of it just kind of kind of view your life like that but my parents are really amazing they're very well-respected and well-loved in their community. So I think it was a testament to the way they live their lives that so many friends and colleagues and family wanted to help our family, you know? So it helped us also become a little more public. I was very private when I was younger and, and, and didn't want to talk about it, but it enabled me to see how powerful it is when you share your struggles with people and everyone has something going on. That's the other thing you learn. You realize, you know, we all, we feel like we're so significant or our problems are so significant, but at the end of the day, that's not really the case. You know, everyone has their own stuff going on. So it's kind of refreshing if you just let it all hang out.
Yeah, I'd say it's significant to us and everybody's problems is significant to them. You know, like something that we might be going through, somebody else would have no problem with that because they've been doing it when they've had the experience. But then something that they were going through, for us, it might have been, you know, that must have been something uh, real easy that we went through, you know. So it's all, uh, like you're saying, you know, it's all uh, relative. And it's true to talk to people to find out that uh, we're not alone in our, in our struggles you know, through life. That's so Simon. Well, I want to, to mention on this topic of friendship, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm quoting Helen Keller here, who, I don't know if you know, is considered the founder of positive psychology, of the entire field of positive psychology. She, obviously, she was brilliant and um, amazing. But on the topic of friendship, she said, my friends have made the story of my life in a thousand ways. They have turned my limitations into beautiful privileges. And that's Helen Keller. Wow, that's terrific. For me, that sums up uh, how I feel, you know, about being uh, visually impaired and, and then how I feel about my friends. Or, I really think it applies to any friendship more broadly. Great. I know you just found about vulnerability. You've been listening to the podcast. I know you like that. The Brave Heart of Podcasts. That could be your new uh, tagline. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. It really sums it up. That's very good. Well, Daria, thanks for talking with me today. It's very nice to speak with you. And if people wanted to contact you about the group. Thank you so much for asking. I really appreciate it. The way to register for the group is to go to the Lighthouse Guild website. So if you go to the Lighthouse Guild, they have a section on registering for their telephone support groups. And mine is the group for teenagers. It's really easy to register. It's like a one page form online and then you're in the group. Yeah, I'm in the group as well. And I can say from firsthand experience that the groups are very, good and they're very good resources and we have a lot of good speakers that come to uh, to speak and it's very good work that you're doing. Thank you, Simon. It's been an honor and a pleasure having you in the group this year. It's been a total highlight for me and it's made the experience so memorable and rewarding. Oh yeah. Yeah, same for me as well. Such a great conversation. Daria Zabowski, thank you so much for coming on The Blind Abilities and sharing your journey and your insight with us all. And Simon, Another great job. Thank you very much, Simon. And a big thank you goes out to Chichao for his beautiful music. And you can follow Chichao on Twitter at El Chichao. 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 And be sure to enable the blind ability skill on your Amazon device just by saying, Enable Blind Abilities. I want to thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed. And until next time, bye bye. When we share what we see through each other's eyes, eyes, we can then then begin begin to bridge bridge the gap gap between between the limited limited expectations and the reality reality of blind abilities. abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. On Twitter at Blind Abilities. Download our app from the App Store, Blind Abilities, that's two words. Or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.